the old ways are gone, and yet they must be carried on, or life on earth will not go on. Welcome to part two of One with the Story, a tribute to Thomas Doty. In part one, we focused on Doty's early days of storytelling and his discovery of his Native American roots. You can find that on archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. In this part, we hear from Janice Tipton, William Horton, and Doty's daughter, Irina Summer, as well as Chris Kibbe and Jesse Jackson. This part focuses on Doty's honing of his art, and we begin with Janice Tipton. Thomas, um, I got to know back in the 19, early 1980s as a storyteller and followed him with the different programs he was doing at that time locally. And what I have to say today is I feel like he became a master storyteller. He, his expressions, his stories, were so engaging for people of all ages. And I got to experience it mostly through the library system because I used to work, I just retired uh, last year. And we had him for so many different programs for all ages. And he just would keep everybody on the edge of their seat or just laughing and he engaged them in working with him in the stories. And it was a marvelous skill that he had. And he then went on to being an educator and went into the schools to do it. And our local Bruch um, principal just recently said to me, she said, oh, it is such a loss. He really engaged those kids so well and did and spoke to each one of them in his telling. So um, he was a remarkable person. I first time I really saw Tom was his first performance at the Vintage Inn. And um, I went there with uh, another friend who knew him um, because uh, he was a professor at, at um, Southern Oregon State College at that time. So, but. Um, that was quite a long time ago. And then Tom and I just um, slowly became good friends over a period of time. And uh, well, gee, um, he, he used, when he used to go on tour, he used to tour with a trailer and a portable stage and, and um, a whole bunch of other accoutrements. And, he began to realize that it really wasn't about all of those other things as he uh, honed his art. And um, eventually the trailer went away and, and um, pretty much when um, in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, pretty much he, Tom, was everything Tom needed when he was on stage and um, or in a gymnasium or in front of a campfire or you know all those other things that that he did and he he um, he went a lot of places he was hired by the government to perform at um, at uh, camps, uh, you know, campgrounds and things like that in his early days. And, and he, his focus was always, at least Tom said this, his focus was always on the art of storytelling. And, um, and he really, what he really wanted to do all of his life was stand up and tell stories. Um, and he um, used to tell a lot of stories over cups of coffee, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we actually told stories together for many years, starting when I was 
pretty young in grade school, maybe fourth or fifth, fifth grade, perhaps. And we traveled around and told Native American stories. And that was my job for a while, <laughs> um, up, up through middle school, part of high school. And it was, I, I didn't realize at the time what a unique experience I was having. I mean, looking back on it, it's, I'm not sure many other people get to have that experience. Um, we all have our unique times with our parents and what they've given to us. Tom was, uh, um, he really was um, very clever about the way he went about his storytelling. And, um, and, and really, it was always um, with the Native American um, um, thought in mind. His, his, he had a grandmother that was um, a grandmother. Yeah, I think it was a grandmother that um, used to live down on um, the Klamath on, in Coyote's Paw, which is a village site down on the Klamath River. And he used to visit that a lot just to, for inspiration. And Tom walked a lot. <laughs> and um, I gave him time to think, I think. But um, he worked very hard. He was one of the hardest working um, people I've known because he worked very hard at his art. Um, he didn't always get jobs. There were some very dry times uh, after um, after two th after uh, nine eleven in two thousand one. Um, everything dried up really fast. The government um, he had some government uh, contracts that um, were canceled, and it, it he had some real hard times, but he never gave up. He never went out and looked for other non-storytelling kinds of jobs, like being a barista or something to, to get by. And um, he just relied on his abilities and his, um, his art form. Gestures, movements, facial expressions, all of those things, they're all part of, of the art of Native storytelling. And gestures in particular, come from uh, several different places. A lot of the gestures are based on Native American sign language. Mm. Um, some of the gestures are traditional Northwest Coast gestures that I use that were just developed through storytelling, and even those have stories. For instance, um, in a story I might say, um, the boy thought, and he thought, and he thought. So American sign language is the, the thinking is this, I right? See. So he thought, and he thought, pulling my audience in that way. And he thought Indian sign language is this. Good thinking comes from the heart, not I the head. See. So I'm actually giving you a translation of two different sign languages. Wow. Pulling in my audience this way, but bringing everything right here to the to heart. To the center. When it's important, right? Beautiful. So those kinds of, those kinds of things So happen. there's a dance going on when you Yeah, and sometimes the gestures us. are absolutely spontaneous too. So, but it's a mixture of all of that. Mm, nice. That's how the stories are kept alive. You're not doing a historical rendition. You're doing a in the now rendition of the story. And so people can relate to it in the modern times. And that's, that, that's basically what he did. Because he would, you know, put his own words in there, he would rewrite things, he would keep the basic idea there, but he wanted to make sure it was accessible. So um, it never felt like we were trying to keep a tradition alive. It felt like the tra tradition was alive and we were just doing it. The interesting thing about Native American stories is that a lot of them are teaching you something because they were uh, pretty much a verbal, oral uh, community, the way they told their stories and the way they carried them on and told them to their children and their children told them to their children. and. So they were always, they always had some kind of a twist to the story that actually brought it around to some kind of lesson those characters learned with the story. And to see the children engaging with that was great because it helped them 
laugh with things that were funny the animals did and silly things they did and then how they learned from their silliness or their mistakes or whatever happened in the story. So it was really a teaching tool at the same time. And that's what was so great about it. So when you're listening to his stories, you know, and I, I, I as I understand you had that experience multiple times, uh, what kind of uh, response did you find yourself having in uh, just as a listener of what Thomas Doty was doing? Oh, I usually got very involved with the story for sure. It was because of how he can pull you right in. Um, I often really kind of watched the rest of the people too, because it was really exciting watching because I know my own community and had been around a lot of the children in the community, it was really wonderful to watch children that had a hard time engaging with sitting still, listening to stories, and um, wanting to read. And when he started talking to them, their eyes just got big and excited and you could just see what was happening. And that just made me feel so good because I knew that he was affecting others just as much as he affected me as far as feeling uh, such good feelings from his stories. So I, I tell school children a lot, especially fourth graders in Oregon when they're studying Native Americans, say, hey, if you really want to learn about us Native Americans, the best way to do that is to listen to our stories or, mm. or read our stories. Mm. A lot of them been written down because that's the way we've been learning about ourselves for centuries. Mm. But of course, stories do even more than that because stories, when they are doing their best work, when they're working their magic, stories heal. Mm. The stories go down to that place where we feel emotions like sadness and happiness and everything in between and they stay with us for a long time. That's Facts right. don't do that. That's right. They're they in one ear, out the other, but stories do that. And we're hardwired to respond to mm. the stories, right? And we were, we were talking earlier, and you mentioned the story about the, the little girl. And, and uh, you know, a few years back when I was doing a, a residency, an artist residency at a school on the Oregon coast, and I was going to be there for three weeks, you know, telling stories, teaching storytelling. And a, and a fourth grade girl's first day in that school uh, was my first day as well, right? And she moved all the way from Lakeview out in the desert to the coast, big change of mm. environment, mm -hmm. right? And of course, the hardest thing like it is for anybody who goes through that is leaving her friends behind, hoping to make new friends in her new school. And so one day I was working in her classroom, you know, and, and she had been being teased by the other mm -hmm. kids. First day she walks into the school, kids start making fun of her skinny legs, right? And she was hoping to make friends. She's feeling really bad. Well, while I was working in her classroom, all the kids came up with their own stories they're going to perform, right? So there are all these groups of kids all over the classroom, right? Doing all kinds of gestures and movements and silly faces and, you know, all that Preparing stuff we stories. do when we tell stories, mm -hmm. right? And right in the middle of that chaos of rehearsal, the little girl comes up to me and she says, Mr. Doty, I want to tell my story to the entire class and I want to do it right now. And I said, well, okay. So we gathered everybody together, right? And, and this little girl got up in front of her class, which took courage. A lot of those kids have been teasing her. So she tells a story all about this big bird crane, right, with very skinny legs, right? <laughs> and in her story, like, crane is being teased by the other animals because of her skinny legs, and, and this crane is thinking, this is not good. We should judge people by how they look. There's more to me than skinny legs. Well, in her story, there was a river. It was a wide river, deep river, swift flowing river. The animals always wanted to see what was on the other side of the river but they couldn't get across it. It was too deep to wade, too swift to swim. This was before there were bridges, before birds had wings, you know. There was no way to get across the river. So one day, Crane took one of her long, skinny legs, right, stretches it all the way across the river, makes the very first bridge, 
so the animals can travel across, see what's on the other side. But you better not tease Crane about her skinny legs, right? You might be halfway across the river at the deepest part of the river, the swiftest part of the river, and Crane might get the shakes like that and dump you off, and that would be the end of you. And it was like, whoo, that's how she ended her story, like, whoo. It was quiet in the classroom. The theme of the story, the the power, the teaching, the wisdom, the moral, the meaning, the message, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. don't judge people. That came across loud and clear, and the bell rang, and the kids went out to recess, and an amazing thing happened. Oral tradition happened right there. Kids who had heard the story in the classroom, they went out on the playground, and they told that story to kids who hadn't heard the story. And just like our Native American stories have been spreading around for mm -hmm. thousands of years, that, that story spread all through the school. And, and by the end of the day, most of the kids had quit teasing her about her skinny legs. And by the end of the three weeks when I left, she had some really good friends. Yay. That's what we call a healing story. I had done a little bit of storytelling myself, and that's how I even kind of got interested in paying attention to Thomas Doty was because um, I did enjoy telling stories myself. And in a lot of my story time sessions with younger children, I adapted them into more of a storytelling and would um, rephrase the stories from books into something that I could more visually talk to them instead of just reading to them. So he really got me started in doing more in my own work even though I didn't go to a lot of storytelling festivals and, and get into that part of it, it really helped me in my work with programming with children, just watching how he did it and then learning how to use that same kind of engage children to want to learn. When we would travel telling stories, it was, he always made <laughs> the specific choice to take any road that was um, barely on the map or, or not on the map. Um, so let's say we wanted to travel to Portland. We had a gig or we were just going to go camping somewhere. Uh, we would barely ever take the I-5 and we'd try not to take 99. And we would end up like, where does this road go? Or he would know where some petroglyph was or where some sacred spot was and he'd want to check it out. So it would take about I don't know, 10 hours maybe to get to Portland. And it was wonderful. It was, I, I didn't notice how immersed in all of that I was because it was just life. It's like, oh, well, of course, there's the rock people and there's the tree people. And, um, and, and I, I know this or that story. I tell my friends, oh, well, yeah, coyote fell out of the sky and fell on Mount Mazama and made a hole. And now that's Crater Lake. Don't you know that? <laughs> it was just um, all around me all the time, which I'm, I'm really grateful for. Tom never backed down. I mean, he just said, this is what I do. And if I have to miss a couple of meals, then I will. But he was very dogged about, you know, going out and looking, you know, contacting schools and doing workshops. And um, he, he, he developed a, um, a rock writing, um, sort of a rock writing lesson that um, he used that ties in with the, um, with the mo movement and enhance um, symbols that you use when you tell a story. And, um, and, and he would show the kids how those, how the thinking behind the, the rock writing and the thinking behind the hand gestures um, in storytelling, especially Native American storytelling, went together and how they matched up. I, I think that he really had this special way of integrating his art, integrating all sorts of aspects of story into his art. Like he, 
he really liked Hal Holbrook's performance. I don't know if anybody of you, if anyone knows this, look it up, it's really great. Hal Holbrook's performance of Mark Twain tonight, where he plays, is like a stand-up show he did, where he plays Mark Twain, playing himself, reading his books, playing the characters in his books. So there's all these levels of, of performance involved. And I know that my dad really liked looking that, at that to integrate into a storytelling. Dodie, the storyteller, um, telling the story. So the storyteller, the, the person, the storyteller, the story, the characters in the story, the characters talking about the other characters in the story. So he would really want, and then the, and then the mythology going through all of it. He really wanted these levels, which was very unique, I thought. Well, you know, a lot of the original stories are, are Dodie and Coyote stories. And maybe I'll just read a short one here. Yeah, perfect. Uh, this is, uh, we mentioned Table Rocks, this is perfect. Coyote and I traipse across the top of the flat-topped mesa called Lower Table Rock. On this autumn night, the stars burn bright, and the rosy moon blushes just over the horizon. Tiny red lights flicker along the trail, and larger ones blink in the trees on Upper Table Rock across the valley. Fog snakes along the valley floor, shrouding the Rogue River and the many communities scattered along its course. But Coyote and I walk between fog and stars, and the night breathes mystery into our hearts. Coyote says, this is just the sort of night we might meet him. Him? Yes, him, that ancient one, the master of tricksters from the old time, that younger dragonfly brother. Oh, across the valley there, that's Elder Doll Doll, the older of the two brothers. He's far too serious to my liking, but here on this rock, we are standing on the back of younger Doll Doll, master of tricks and magic and brimming with humor. We are standing right on him. We walk on crossing the abandoned landing strip, stepping carefully between ankle-twisting rocks, sloshing through vertical pools circled by rabbit brush, and finally into the trees. We are getting closer to the edge of the rock, a 300-foot drop onto heaped-up piles of razor-sharp basalt. We feel a damp breeze rush our way from the edge, a breeze that lifts fog from the river and laps it over the top like ocean waves onto a beach. We pass an ancient black oak, twisted with shadows and age. An owl hoots five times, stars spin, red lights flash. And before coyote and idle time has passed, we find ourselves walking dangerously close to the edge, many yards from our last steps, the fog lapping our faces damp. That was the younger dragonfly. See how he works, full of power, the guardian of this rock. Well, he might have sent us over the edge. Every few years I hear about someone falling. But he didn't. <laughs> but he didn't. Between fog and stars, Coyote and I walk back toward the trail that winds down the rock. Neither of us offers a rational explanation for what has happened. Neither speaks. Each senses that silence is what makes the most sense. Right now in such a place as this. Chris Kibbe recalls Dodie telling stories to middle school students. And, um, I was working as a school administrator in Eugene at one of the middle schools. The building was a high poverty building. And uh, so the students didn't have a lot of exposure to museums or live performances, things like that. And um, in sixth grade, they study about the salmon culture. And salmon is really important to Pacific Northwest indigenous people. And so Thomas would come at the end of October for the salmon unit. And he would um, talk to all of the sixth grade students at one time. And sometimes we'd do it in the library. Most of the time we did it in the library because it was a quiet space. And the kids would sit on the floor 
and Thomas would be there. He would always have his stool with him. But um, let me tell you, from, from the time he started talking until the time the students had to go to their next class, they were enthralled. He, he would tell them a mix of um, Native American stories about salmon and salmon boy and why salmon was important to the people and some of the lessons that Coyote taught the people about salmon and how to take care of salmon. And he would tell them about the Tekelma um, salmon ceremonies that happened in the spring and how the ceremony had been um, reactivated with the help of a Tekelma elder, Agnes Baker Pilgrim, Tawawi. And um, the, the kids were just mesmerized. It, it's hard to describe. Um, Thomas had such a personality, you know, um, he, he would change his facial features and his hand gestures and, and somewhat his voice, and he would just become the character that he was telling you about. He didn't need a microphone. He didn't need any mask or props. All he needed was himself. And uh, when there was time, the students would ask him questions. And afterwards, they would write thank you notes and something that they had learned from his presentation. And I was really pleased that he took the time to put some of those thank you notes up on his website. And, uh, you know, the kids always enjoyed having him come. Jesse Jackson relates the importance of the Tekelma's storytellers. The single most important person for all of the Tekelmans because for thousands and thousands of years, the storytellers were your record keepers. And it was, it was a chosen position. I mean, this was something where, where our elders would see these children come up from five and six and seven and 10 years old. And they would notice, oh, there's a five and six year old here that he's talking to a lot of our older people. He's communicating with elders a lot more than some of these other kids. And his path was decided then. In, in, and so, um, so he's just he's super special. Thomas Doty was that special to so many people. We pay tribute to him for dedicating his life to preserving and sharing stories from the Tacoma people. We'll hear from more of Thomas Doty's friends and family and share more aspects of his incredible life in our next part. This has been part two, Honing the Art. There's more to come. I'm John Lex. Spirits walking the wind whisper, the old ways are gone, and yet they must begin again. Spirits walking the wind whisper, the old ways are gone, and yet they must be carried on. Away.